Okay, so last week we started in Psalm 121, and we spoke about the Jewish people being on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for worshiping God, and they used this psalm as they went along as one of their. Did did, did we? Oh, I, I kind of vaguely remember that from yeah. mega years ago. Um, so in verse 1, which is all as far as we go, <laughs> we talked about uh, the fact that you need to keep looking up, looking towards the goal, keeping yourself focused on those hills and mountains that were ahead because the mountains and hills represented where God was. And, and that's where you look for your help, for your provision for things in life is our, our creator, our God. So let's start where we left off in Psalm 121, verse 2. My help comes from the Lord. That was the response to the uh, verse 1. My help comes from the Lord. He made heaven and earth. So as the traveler looked towards the hills, you know, his goal, right, and the city even itself, he might even see Jerusalem as he's getting closer, he knew his help only came from God the Creator, right? Couldn't come from man, couldn't come from, you know, people in the city. It's only going to come from God while they're out on the road. Because we talked about their dangers while they're out on the road, and it is a concern. If they get into trouble, where's their help coming from, right? But it's also for us, you know, as we go through life, as we travel through life, where does our help come from? our creator and that's where you look to you don't look to people things places you look to god so our god who created heaven and earth demonstrating that he can do anything can be trusted to help us in our time of need so you know that's sometimes where we drop the ball sometimes we 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 know in our head we know from scripture that he is the creator, that he made the heavens and the earth, the universe and everything that's in it, people, bugs, whatever. He made it all, but sometimes we let go of that fact when we think about ourselves and our own needs or the needs of our friends or our family or our church or our job. We forget and we say, oh, we know he's creator, but oh, he can't help me with this problem. But yes, he can. If he could create the sun, and contain the power inside a sun, you know he can help you, right? And so you need to remind yourself. And so like, this is one of my favorite verses that I, I uh, memorized one time when I was going through tough times, trouble, needing help from the Lord, looking to him for help. And I love this verse, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. There is nothing too hard for you. It's a great verse to memorize or keep on your refrigerator or by your chair where you sit. So if you're having a tough time, you know you can count on God. He is all powerful. He created the planet. He can take care of you. So write that one down if you've never learned it. So there's another story in the New Testament that speaks to the same issue of looking to the mountains, so to speak, for your help, where God comes to help you. And I think you'll remember this one in Mark 6, 45 through 51. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to, the, to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Mm -hmm. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. So Jesus, God in the flesh, was where? On a mountain, right? Praying after he'd spent the day working with the crowds. And what, where was he at when he saw the disciples? On the mountain. So he sees you where you're at. That, you know, in a human sense, that seems like an impossibility. Here he is on a mountain. They're rowing in the middle of a lake, right? And, and he sees what's going on with them. And he saw them in the middle of the night. It's dark. And he's fully aware 
of everything that's gone on with them, that they've been straining for hours rowing that boat. They haven't gotten anywhere, really. But he knows exactly what's going on in our lives, too, right? Jesus came down from the mountain to calm the storm and ease fears for his disciples. He can do the same for us. So the storm didn't stop God from seeing. The distance didn't stop God from seeing. The darkness didn't stop from seeing. He knew right where they were at and what they needed. And you know, the story doesn't mention them calling out to God, does it? Right? He still met their need even without them even calling out to them. That's how aware he was of what they needed. I think it's so funny, he's walking on the water, he's just about to pass by. I know. Hi, dude. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. It's like, why is that in there? It's like, hey, 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 what's happening, guys? <laughs> Heading on out. I'm going to the other side of the beach. You guys coming? <laughs> but um, last week, Pastor Terry did that message about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Debbie. I was just going to say, I've read one time uh, about this particular passage and Jesus this was uh, the I don't know if it's the week or the day that he found out that John the Baptist was beheaded oh so his his cousin was beheaded mm -hmm. one of the major guys of the of the movement mm -hmm. and then he says I gotta go to the mountain gotta see the Lord mm -hmm. and it was brought up I don't even know what book it was now mm -hmm. That uh, mentioned that it was the same time yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah. Even with the heartache he experienced, he was human. Uh -huh. Was his cousin. And that's exactly what they said. He still was he there. Was in heartache, and yet ministering to the people there. Right. Still. But um, Pastor Terry talked about the the mama hen takes her chicks under the wings. Psalm ninety one four. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. What a great verse. <laughs> when I was looking at pictures of hens and chickens, I saw a couple of these crazy chickens. <laughs> One hen, her kids must have been teenagers at this point, I'm thinking. They're bigger. They're not the baby, baby chicks. And there were like ten of them under her. <laughs> right? <laughs> my, my grandfather was a, an evangelist, uh -huh. and he used uh, this illustration in this uh, passage of scripture in that there was a prairie fire where he was working on wherever he was working as a young man, mm -hmm. and when they went through the field after the fire had gone over it, they came on a, a mother hen, mm -hmm. and she was burnt, but when they mm -hmm. picked it up, all of her kids, all of her babies ran out mm -hmm. alive. And I can imagine that was such a vivid mm -hmm. expression of this verse. Yeah. You know, that totally illustrate how, how much she protects us. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful illustration. So in the storms of life, we can run under the protection of our Lord's wings, so to speak. Hello, who's online? I can't see who all's on there. I think Ruthie is. I can see Ruthie is. I think there's some other people. So hello, ladies. So Ruthie, I was so short, I got on and you got off. Oh. Did you, a oh, short last or did you just get on late? Well, you know, it's hard to know when you're on. <laughs> yeah. Right? I know. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes it's long, sometimes short. Yeah. So let's read on in Psalm 121, 3 and 4. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He, keep, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God is so protective of us, of us that he won't let our foot slip or slide, depending on your translation, or move. You know, every, different, different versions have it different ways. Yeah, apparently we need to pray about that, right? <laughs> In scripture, the sliding or slipping of the feet means a type of misfortune or falling into sin. He's there for us to keep us from falling into sin, 
or having misfortunes in our life. He's there for us. That's what this verse is talking about. Can I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. um, Israel is being attacked as a country. Mm -hmm. God knows. Oh yeah, he knows. It's, it's really hard for our little rabbi because it's his family. Well, it's home. And yeah, and home. Yeah. And he brought that. That verse? Not this verse particularly, but just the reminder that God will not let mm -hmm. Israel be destroyed. Oh yeah, and there's a lot of scripture about that. He'll take, he'll take care of them one way or the other. So, what is uh, one of the things that God helps us, what, one way does he help us not to slip? You can see one of them in Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So obeying God's word is what that's talking about, and delighting in God will help keep our feet from slipping, right? If you're learning the word and obeying it and putting your focus on God, you're going to be a whole lot less likely to slip into sin or misfortune. That's just one way he helps us keep from slipping. He gives us his word. This one? Yeah. You don't have a copy well there. She's not sitting close enough to the queen. You have to you have to be right on top of somebody and look over their I shoulder. Had, I heard lots of teachers who didn't approve of that. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Plus the queen doesn't have her ears in so we can talk about her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got it? Yes. And you got this one, right? Yes, I do. Okay, so let's reread that those verses again. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. And then, of course, the next verse, um, neither slumber nor sleep when it regards to Israel, which is what you were talking about. Now, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, probably, in our, one of our Psalm 139 lessons about how God watches over us through the night, just like a mom watches her child is there when they wake up, you know. This is another way that God keeps us from slipping. Our God never sleeps. He does not grow weary, right? He keeps us from slipping by watching over us. So he's there for us, watching what's going on. He'll be there when we need him. It's not like he's missing in action. We can't get a hold of him, right? All we have to do is call out to him. Uh, gee, the disciples were very fortunate. They didn't even have to call out. He just went. He's, God was paying attention. Everybody got it? So this leads to another favorite verse of mine, probably some of you. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So we don't have to worry about him being worn out, too tired to help us, incapable of helping us. He's perfectly able. So let's go back to those verses again. What else does it say? It says, your foot keeps you, and then of course, as Claudia mentioned, keeps Israel. So verse 3 is a reminder that God cares about the individual, and he's watching over you personally, right? And verse 4 is a reminder that he's watching the nation Israel as a whole. He cares about them as a whole as well. So the individual is not lost in the multitude. God cares about both. Now there are some, and you guys probably have heard of these people, the deists. There were a lot of deists way back in the day. I don't, I'm sure there's still some today. Um, they don't think that God intervenes in human affairs. They think he created mankind, created the earth, and then just steps back and lets things go. Right, that's basically what a deist believes, that God is there, but he's not involved. He's not paying attention. 
But our God is not like that. We, do not, we cannot be deists. We believe in a God that cares for us and loves us. He's paying attention to us as individuals, as whole nations. He's paying attention and he loves us. So this verse in verse 4 is one of those verses like we're talking about with Claudia that is very comforting for Israel because they know that he's watching them. He's taking care of them. He's going to protect them. I just love it. There's a, a passage in, I think it's Ezekiel is what I want to say, where all the enemies of Israel uh, go after them, attack them. And yet God stops all those countries from attacking them. He's going to take care of them, even though it looks terrible, like ten nations are coming against you, but he's going to wipe them out, stop them in their tracks. He, he cares about his people. He's going to take care of them. Is that the passage where he shows Elisha, tells them to show his partner, his, his cohort there, all the protection they have with the angels all around? No, this is in Ezekiel. That's in... I know, but Elisha was Ezekiel's... N no. Oh, Elisha. Yeah. That was Elijah and his servant. That's in like Kings, I think. Too many E names. So God will always protect and care for his people Israel. That's something you can remember. They've been going through a lot of horrible stuff in the past and now. And there's lots of scripture. And I only put down a few that we were just kind of look quickly through when you guys are ready. So Zechariah 2, 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. So don't mess with Israel. It's a warning to us and every other nation or individuals. Don't mess with him. Don't mess with his people. They're his apple of his eye. They're special to him. Deuteronomy 33, 29. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemy shall submit to you, and you shall tread down their high places. So he takes care of his people. And we saw that when we were studying Joshua. He made a way for them to take over the land of Canaan. He, he provided a way. He was there for them. Isaiah 46, 3-4, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age I am he, and even to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and I will deliver you. So he's going to be there for them. He's going to take care of them. You know, because we're human, sometimes... We place our human frailties or the things we experience in life on our almighty God. Um, like, um, they, taint, they taint our perception or our view of God. You know, like if we have a bad father, we have a hard time picturing God as our loving father. You know, understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So sometimes what weaknesses we experience in life, we try to put on our, our father, our, on, on our creator. He's not us. He's not human like us. Um, you know, like when we, we've had these verses about him watching us and being there for us through the night and being there in the morning when we awake. Now, as parents, we know we can't watch our children 100% of the time, right? Um, even if you're in your house with your kids, you can be in one room and you'd think they'd be okay, right? But no, they've gotten into a fist fight in the next room. <laughs> Somehow, Billy just bopped Johnny on the head, and he's got a bleeding head, you know, because they were... But you were just in the next room. They should have been safe, right? So we see those weaknesses and frailties in our life, and we sometimes think, well, God's not going to come through for us on that, you know, because, you know, I just can't expect 100% of the time he's going to be there for me. But we can't do that. He is not us. We can't assume because of our weaknesses or the weaknesses we experience in people that that's the way God is. He's not like that at all. Can I share some real quick mm -hmm. with what you're saying? Mm -hmm. um, I, I ordered a book and it's called Permission to Live Free. Mm -hmm. Living the Life God Created for You. Mm -hmm. And I just started the first chapter and she talks about, she's a doctor. Her name is Jackie Green. She's a dentist. Mm -hmm. And her husband have a church in North Carolina or something. But she talks about um, 
being a child and then her f be, being free is who God created you to be and who she was free up until she was four years old and then her mom put some chemicals in her hair to control it because it was really nappy or kinky and it caused bald spots. Oh. And so um, that took away, then she lost herself who God truly intended her to be because oh. now she experienced this. And then she talks as going through that that um, she made excuses for that, that the reason why she wore extensions because it was easier and it was this and that, but it wasn't her truth and she had to accept that truth. And so we, and she gets to see, when you accept those truths about excuses you're making for yourself, then you see the true person you are that God made you to be. Right. And you, you can have a relationship with God that you're not making excuses or blaming all kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting you said that. I just started reading that. Isn't just, that funny? It says God's timing. Exactly. Yeah. Wants to get that point out, doesn't he? What's wrong, what's wrong with our babies at school? They can't they mm. have a concept of God. Yeah, yeah I mean, she talks, it's, it's right. going to be very interesting, but she talks about and how we're part of God's DNA. Mm -hmm. He created us, we're part of his DNA, and so she talks about all that, and it's very interesting. It sounds like a doctor perspective. <laughs> but, it's, but it's true. We carry all this stuff, and we, mm -hmm. we experience things, and then we hold on to that, and we perceive right. things, and we do all this stuff, and we're not... Truly, up. and so she talks about when when she first does her inspirational speech, and she goes to peek through the curtains, and like the room is full, and mm -hmm. she knows it's full online and all this kind of stuff, and she goes back to the mirror, and she sees her true self. Um, she sees that four year old again, um, that four year old inside of her, that's um, free to experience this, and and she knows that um, that's God's plan for her. So yeah. it's very interesting. Sounds like a good book. Yeah. yeah. We'll have you give a book report later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's not done. That's what I said. She'll have to give us updates. <laughs> so just because we are incapable of fully watching or protecting our children doesn't mean our God cannot. He is not frail or weak like us. So this is where you boost your faith. Don't doubt. He created the heavens and the earth, and he's not frail like us. So you remember the story of Hagar, the Egyptian slave of Sarai? Yeah. She ran away from Sarai. I guess my brain, I kind of short-circuited this story. I realized she, twice she left. Um, the first time, this is the first time I'm referring to it, she ran away because she was being mistreated from, by Sarai. So let's read a little bit of her story. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring of the, on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from? Boy, he's really formal with her. And where, where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they will, shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. And he shall be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? So even though Hagar wasn't one of God's chosen people, right? She wasn't an Israelite, she wasn't a Hebrew. Um, he still cared for her and saw her where she was at, out there hiding in the, in the desert, fleeing her mistress. He, it's just like Jesus. He saw his disciples from afar. So he is the God who sees. Our God is the God who sees all of us and will meet us where we're at. So just like she was in a bad place, she was fearful, running away from her mistress, he saw where she's at and what she needed. He gave her the encouragement she needed to go on, and he met her need. And like he met the disciples in the boat, calmed their fears, got them to where they needed going. So it's the same with us, right? He's going to take care of us where we're at. He's going to meet us where we're at, right? It's also a picture of God being a God of everyone, not just Israel. Exactly. 
all his creation, he reads right. out to the Old Testament. That's right, and you see it multiple times in the Old Testament. He reached out to the Gentiles, those people that were not Israelites. So what did Jesus tell us himself in Matthew 6, 26 through 30? Amen. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So if God is aware of, cares for, and provides for a little bird or a flower in the field, he will care and provide for us. Even the littlest creature is in his vision, right? And that should speak to us, you know, if we're feeling insignificant or unworthy, no, you are worthy. God pays attention to you. So, so far we've learned a couple of ways that God helps us to keep our feet from slipping. So what is one of the most important and main ways that he keeps us from slipping? Hang on. Oh. Say him. <laughs> okay. She meant wait. Okay. Psalm 94 had this to say about that. Who will rise up for me against the evil do doers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will help me up. Hold me up. <laughs> Hold me up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. So when our foot is slipping, God's mercy or love, and it depends on the translation, this word is translated both ways, will hold us up and keep us from falling. So number one, his love and mercy and compassion, which are infinite and inexhaustible, saves us, right? And he holds us up, he keeps us from falling with his mercy and love, keeps us from slipping. Good one, Debbie. <laughs> I just meant you stay close. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, I guess, what, the, hold on to his foot or whatever. <laughs> well, it's like said to me, God's not surprised. He's right behind you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> He's right beside us. How about that? He's right beside us. He's not stalking us from behind. I mean, it already bugs me that he knows the words before they come out. Of I the know. Room. That's yeah. It's kind of scary in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> We are unable to keep ourselves from slipping into, etern into eternal separation from God because of our sin, but God's mercy can. God's mercy keeps us from being separated from Him. Best, best way He keeps us from slipping is right there. Keeps us from separation. Have we done better with no big words like in perpetuity? Yes, very nice. <laughs> I didn't ever have to look them up and get the wrong word anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll come back to you, Claude. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I don't know where my, well, you're thinking too much. Yeah, you're there. thinking ahead of yourself yeah. and moving ahead. So Hebrews. Thank you, Claude. <laughs> you got this one? Almost. Okay. okay, so Hebrews 2.17 says, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To, oh, here's your big word, to make propitiation. <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> for the sins of the people. So that's where his mercy, he brought propitiation for our sins, right? Yes, that's, that's his love and mercy for us. He keeps us from slipping into the pit. Thank goodness. God. So in one last way that he keeps us slipping is David writes about in 2 Samuel 22, 34 through 37. 
He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me on high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You also have given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. So David uses the imagery of a deer in his, the psalm that's kind of hidden inside 2 Samuel. And this deer seems to skip from place to place safely. He's never losing his footing. Um, of course, I should, maybe it's not a he, it could be a girl. Um, <laughs> so David re relates this to how God gave him the same kind of skill in working through the challenges brought on by his enemies. And, you know, we all face trouble in life and God can make our way safe and secure and help us to jump from place to place and get through all of it safely, right? So our God will enlarge our path. That's what David's saying. He'll enlarge our path. He gives us that sure way to, to walk or give us the gifts and skills. That's what enlarging our path means. He gives us the gifts and skills. We need to stand secure and not slip even in difficult situations. So if you ever, you know, feeling like things are getting getting tough, ask him to enlarge your path. You quote this verse to him when you're talking to him. Say, enlarge my path, God. Give me what I need so that I stand sure-footed so I don't slip and fall. That you get me through this situation. Make me like a deer. So remember, God is watching over you and is there to help you and keep you from slipping. Right? And he's all-powerful. Creator of heaven and earth, okay? All right? 